How are you all? I hope we're not bored yet. Jazakumullah. <laughs> May Allah expand our hearts. May Allah expand our hearts. May Allah open the hearing channels of our hearts. May Allah help us benefit from what we hear of words and meanings that are pleasing to Him. And may He keep away from the repertoire of our minds and hearts that which He does not love, regardless of who says it or who does it. Ya Rabbi Ameen. Bismillah, al-lazhi la ilaha siwa, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa alah. Rabbi zidna ilma, wa la tuzigh qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana, wa hab lana min ladunka rahma, innaka anta al-mahab. Ameen, Ya Rabbi. We continue in this um, I believe important discourse and subject concerning um, the sources of differences and, conf and conflict in general and amongst us as Muslims in particular, uh, the root of which are sometimes uh, elements of knowledge in our deen. Either we don't know them or we know them the wrong way or we don't care for them. And secondly, the reason sometimes and most of the time often is what our hearts are like. When the hearts are not in the right frequency, in the right spiritual condition, they're not clean, they're not safi, they're not focused on Allah Azza wa Jal. When we are plagued with internal diseases, even if we know that will still lead us to be in conflict and use what we know of good even in ways that are improper and wrong because of what we are inside. That we always remind ourselves of, but this session and this meeting inshallah and seminar is about mostly the rational and the fiqhi aspect of that and reasons and when we don't know that, that leads also to reasons for conflict and disunity. Now, we continue in making the point through all of these now um, means the point that there is the concept of good bid'ah and not so good bid'ah, wrong bid'ah or evil bid'ah. And that was very natural. This is the practice and the legacy of our Salaf of our righteous predecessors, which are also taken usually always by our scholars as a reference. And they, what they do and how they do what they do is an authority for us to follow. So to, to follow truly the Salaf is not to ignore all these things that we have said in the context of the text, Kullu bid'atin dalala every bid'ah is dalala, that text cannot be taken out of the context of all these other texts that tell us about how our salaf, our predecessors, <coughs> righteous predecessors, <coughs> excuse me, especially of the early generations, have interpreted, have practiced those texts. And that's necessary. And there is so much so far that we have seen to the extent that as far, for example, as I'm concerned, I have no shadow of a doubt about that question anymore. In view of all these, uh, this form and this type of evidence and of proofs mounted from those evidence as well. So we continue in giving examples, actual examples, of how the companions of Allah Ta'ala now, after Rasulullah have understood those texts by the way, by the way they have practiced those texts. Now Sayyiduna Uthman Ta'ala many of you know that though it is not practiced too regularly, it is still practiced in many parts of the Muslim world, Adhan of Jumu'ah. Adhan for Jumu'ah, for Friday Salah, in the time of Rasulullah 
And in the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and in the time of Sayyidina Uthman, was how many adhans were? One adhan. The one that we usually do here. One adhan for Jum'ah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the previous generations did not do more than that. In the time of Sayyidina, excuse me, Afwan, in the time of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala as a Khalifa, he and also as a scholar, was not these the Khulafa al Rashidun were not just leaders, they were scholars, ulama, and mujtahidun, by the way. So he radiallahu ta'ala anhu arwa actually introduced the bid'ah. What is bid'ah? Say it. Something new. Something new that was not there before. It was not there before. That's the word bid'ah. So get used to it again. So he introduced a bid'ah. Ibtada'a, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, another adhan, in addition to the original adhan for Salatul Jum'ah. How did he do that? He introduced the first adhan, the regular adhan became second adhan, which usually when Rasulullah mounts the mimbar, which mimbar is also bid'ah, remember? Do you remember that? Good bid'ah, bid'ah hasana. When he mounts the mimbar, then that's the adhan, which we practice. Sayyiduna Uthman introduced an adhan before that, before that, by some time. Not in the masjid, outside of the masjid, on top of a, of a, of a tower, some tower roof, tower-like, to call another adhan. And he did that. And it was approved by still the companions and the great companions of his time that were still living. And the great ulama, they all accepted that, passed that. It was consistent in accordance to that ishtihad of Sayyidina Uthman with the principles of shara. Of the principles for which, with which this was consistent is that again the city enlarged. And people are outside of it. And time has passed. A lot of time has passed. And there are a lot of business, a lot of activity. And they don't pay attention to get ready for, some don't pay attention, to get ready for Salatul Jum'ah, to stop few things. So he introduced another adhan before that, in the markets, somewhere on top to get them to begin to be ready for Salatul Jum'ah. Because it is consistent with the purpose behind adhan, is al-i'lam, to inform of the time of Salah, in this case to inform of the preparation for Salah. And the ulama of the Sahaba and the rest approved of that and it was definitely in his time and thereafter for centuries in the Muslim world practiced as a bid'ah hasana. It's a good bid'ah. So these are the companions who are doing what by their actions? As far as usul al-fiqh is concerned, by these actions, what are they doing? Yes, on the basis of maslaha, what are they doing? Hmm? No, no, in fiqh sense. They, they are explaining to us, elucidating again, what Rasulullah means by kullu bid'atin dalala. Kullu bid'atin dalala, remember, is am, general term, general hukm. These are all, these details, these specifics, are means by which that am is mukhassas, is specified, is qualified in a sense. So the way they do that, in simple, you know, layman terms, it's explaining to us how we should practice that text. By the way, they practiced. 
and therefore they understood the text. If they understood that kullu bid'atin dalala means nothing at all, they could not and they would not have done all of these things. So they understood that the text is makhsus, is specified and qualified, and that that which is dalala is that which does not uh, go along, does not uh, um, Respect, it does not go along the principles of the shara. That which violates the objectives of the shara, or the principles of the shara, or is not consistent with any of the sources and the rules of the shara. That's what is meant by bid'ah, balala. All the, we have seen also the text of Rasulullah himself specifying that. Now, the practice of the companions of all of that as more of that evidence indeed well maybe it's the battery see something has to I really turned it on, and now I know how to turn it on. Excuse us, please. Excuse us. Technicality. Yes, you have to be done manually now, right? We'll keep working on that. Is it working now? Yeah, it's fine. I think it is tuned to... To Brother Shams, you know, it's tuned to his hands, the barak of his hands. Shabbat. Another case, <coughs> for example, Sayyiduna Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu arba, introduced a famous dua that the scholars like uh, and related by uh, the great compiler of hadith and half of an Imam Ali Sayyid ibn Mansur and Ibn Jarir, the great Ibn Jarir Tabari and Tabarani mention this salawat ala nabi that Sayyiduna Ali invented salah ala nabi Siyah, a formula of salah ala nabi which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself did not teach and there it is briefly اللهم داحي المدحوات وبارئ المسموكات وجبار القلوب على فطرتها شقيها وسعيدها اجعل شرائف صلواتك and so on and so forth على سيدنا على محمد عبدك ورسولك الخاتم لما سبق والفاتح لما أغلق والمعلن الحق بالحق and so on That's a bid'ah in salah ala nabi in dua. Beautiful bid'ah. First of all, how do we know it is beautiful? First, first, how do we know it is beautiful? Well, Ali, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhu said it. First, Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala said it. So that's Beautiful because he knows. You don't ask him why already. He said it, it's beautiful, it's perfect. Then we learn, then we, the scholars, understand and argue how it is consistent with the principles of the Shara and not in violation of any of that. That's a bit of hasana in Salah al Nabi. By the way, part of this Salah al Nabi, some of you might know, Al Khatimi Lima Sabaka, Wal Fatihi Lima Ughliqa, Wa Nasiri Al Haqqi Bil Haqqa, Wa Mu'alini Al Haqqi Bil Haqqa. This is also made famous, this part, by one of the Mashaykh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, who, Sidi Ahmed Al Tijani, made famous. But it's not actually originally his. Some people say, it's, don't say that. 
Why? I don't understand. What's the logic? Why? The words are beautiful, consistent with Tawheed. And first, the origin of it is Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu ta'ala. And many not, don't know that. It's beautiful. It's Salah al-Nabi. And Salah al-Nabi, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't say, don't say any Salah upon me except what I taught you. But if we do that, and do that in ways that are consistent with Tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal, and consistent with the maqam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, then it is within the framework of what is good. And here are, to, to support this statement, here are the Sahaba themselves who did that. Like Sayyiduna wa Mawlana Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arbaah. Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud introduces in Salah al-Nabi that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught, he introduces new words. He introduced because first of all, they must have understood that Salah al-Nabi, the intent is praise and that it is not, the words themselves are not intended for ta'abud. And of course the likes of Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud in terms of mastery of the language and the meanings of language and beautiful meanings of celebrating uh, the beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and before that the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, he in accordance to what the scholars have related like At-Tabarani, Imam Muslim and, and, and Ibn Majah and others that for example he added As-Salamu we say, the original one was, As-salamu alayka, ayyuhan nabi. Living or dead, we address Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as though he's in front of us. As-salamu alayka. That's what you do in your salawat, don't you? As-salamu alayka. Bil muhatab. In the Arabic language, that's when you're addressing someone who is with you, addressing them directly. As-salamu alayka, ayyuhan nabi. And that's what is mutawatir, well established, and we still continue to do. And the Sahaba have done that after that, and so on. Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, in one of the ways he performed Salah al Nabi, is this without alayka, instead of alayka, bisirat al ghaib al Nabi. As salamu al Nabi. Salam upon the Nabi. Instead of salam upon you, O Nabi. He say, Salam ala nabi Salam upon the Nabi. Fine. And he is Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu arwa. This is what? Bid'ah. In the form of Salah ala nabi And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually taught otherwise in this case. But he argued and understood something at his level radiallahu ta'ala which warranted for him to be able to say that. The companions, the rest, said otherwise, just like it was. But this is bitter from Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And because it was Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, no one is going to say, this is bad bid'ah. This is bid'ah, we accept it. Anything that our predecessors like these do, that tells us that we can also do. Room for, room for what? For the variety and diversity. He also added, Salamu alayna min rabbina. Salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salamu alayna wa ala ibadillah salih. He added, Salamu alayna min rabbina. From our Lord. That in accordance with the ulama, that was not in the original text. In Hajj, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik la sharika laka Labbaik, Inna alhamda wa niyamata laka wal mulk, La sharika laka, this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
taught and said. The Sahaba, in his time and after his time, added things, introduced new things in Talbiya. Some of them, لَبَّيْكَ عَدَدَ التُّرَابِ لَبَّيْكَ upon you as many times as the grain of dust in existence. was added, was all accepted by the companions. These are the companions who did that. Also in his, in his tashahud, in his salawat ala al-Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in accordance to what many ulama related, and this is his sunan ibn Majah and others, that he, رضي الله تعالى عنه, he said, when you perform salah upon your Nabi, do it beautifully. أحسنوا الصلاة على نبيكم. As a matter of fact, in some texts, it is said that Rasulullah sallallahu said that. And Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, in one of his salawat, he says, read the rules of Shara. Rasulullah sallallahu sallam deserves the greatest of all celebrations and praise. No matter how much we praise him properly, it is never enough. It is never enough. Is he Sayyid al-Mursaleen? Is he? Yes, not only Sayyid al-Mursaleen, he is? No, not only Sayyid al-Mursaleen, he is Sayyid? All Bani Adam. Sayyid waladi Adam, who said that? Who said that? Who said he is Sayyid waladi Adam? The Sayyid of all children of Adam. Who said that? Himself, he said that. The texts are many, very authentic texts. And Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is only using what he knows to be a fact. Even though Rasulullah didn't say that for himself in Tashahud. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar. In the tashahud, he added Bismillah. We, we read Tahiyatu Lillah, Salawat wa Tayyibat, etc., one of the forms. He added Bismillah, Tahiyatu Lillah, Salawat wa Tayyibat, in accordance to the reports of the ulama such as in Sunan Abu Dawood, that Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Umar added Bismillah. That's called what? Linguistically? Bid'a. Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Umar did that. So it must be good. These are, these are the sources of our law. This is the source of our heritage. They are, as the ulama say, those who lived with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And these are ulama, sahaba, who understood the, uh, the import and the means behind the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and even Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Umar, he even said, he also, he said, Zittu fiha wa barakatuh. I added, he said, I added the word wa barakatuh. The word wa barakatuh in, in the proper place. He added, وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ يعني أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له He said in accordance to what Imam Abu Dawood related Also in Hajj he added لَبَّيْكَ وَسَعْدَيْكَ وَالْخَيْرُ بِيَدَيْكَ He added that It's new It was not in the time of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and even in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa his famous hajjah, other companions with him, having heard what he told them and they practiced that, they used to say some of them, لَبَّيْكَ ذَا الْمَعَارِجْ ذُو الْمَعَارِجْ is the one who subhanahu wa ta'ala has the, the highest dimensions. And the one who owns the means of, of in a sense, spiritual transports to higher dimensions. Like that's why Mi'raj, the Isra wal Mi'raj. Mi'raj literally is a means of transport for ascension into 
space time and beyond. Allah is the Ma'arij. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi didn't say that. They said that and he heard them. This is by the way in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this talbiya. And he approved of that Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not that what they say is like or better than what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. What Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said is the preferred option. But these mean that if that is done consistent with the values of the shara, la haraj. At least, there is no blame in that. That is better, and good, and levels of good, and less good, etc. When Nabi Yisna of La Yaqulu Lahum Shay'a, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was hearing all of that, and he tacitly approved of that. Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sallam. Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anha again, Salat al-Duha, you all know Salat al-Duha as a nafila. He radiallahu ta'ala anha, in his time, he used to believe it is bid'ah. Some ulama would say he believed performing Salat al-Duha as nafila in the masjid is bid'ah. Bid'ah, simply bid'ah. Now, you're already thinking of neg negative bid'ah, isn't it? We, we're conditioned, khalas. We are conditioned. We have to liberate ourselves from that classical conditioning. So I used to believe it is bid'ah in the neutral sense. Whether Salat al-Duha as such, or another interpretation, perform Salat al-Duha in the masjid, even, even individually. He said, Rahimahullah, radiallahu ta'ala, in accordance to one of his students, what one of his students taught Al-A'raj, I asked Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar concerning Salat al-Duha. He replied, Bid'ah. Wa ni'mat al-Bid'ah, he said, end of quote, as related by Imam Ibn Abi Shayba authentically. He says, this is Bid'ah, and what a beautiful Bid'ah it is. This reminds you of what? Of his father, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. Same word, ni'mat al-bid'ah concerning the, the bid'ah of tarawih. Bid'ah of tarawih meaning the way it was done. So he says, salat al-duha, he says, yes, it's bid'ah. But what a beautiful bid'ah it is. Good bid'ah. Ni'mat al-bid'ah to Sayyidi radiallahu ta'ala anhu arwa. In another narration by the great compiler and, and scholar of hadith, of the, of the, uh, I think the second, the second, late second century Hijri, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, Imam Abdul Razak, uh, as in you know, an authentic hadith, a great scholar, Yemeni, uh, scholar of hadith and fiqh and so on, radiallahu ta'ala. He said, in his that he reports that Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar also said, وَمَا أَحْدَثَ النَّاسُ شَيْئًا أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِنْهَا and there is nothing more beloved to me that people have innovated than this Salat al-Duha. In the Sunan of Sa'id ibn Mansur, another great alim of hadith, uh, these are even teachers of, of the great ulama that we know of hadith. إنها محدثة he said he relates that Sayyidina Abdullah ibn ibn Umar said إنها محدثة وإنها لمن أحسن ما أحدثه it is indeed something newly invented and it is of the most beautiful newly invented things that's all these examples and there are a lot more that are conveying to us the very clear, uh, it should be unequivocal, meaning that there is good bid'ah and there is bad bid'ah. There is good bid'ah and there is bad bid'ah. All of this is clear evidence and clear proof from evidence that is indeed the case to the extent it leaves no shadow of a doubt now the ulama of late 
great ulama of different schools of thought, now accepted by all the ulama in all the four schools of thought, for example. When the great ulama, probably around the time of uh, the great uh, scholar, you know, encyclopedic scholar and Zahid scholar, to the extent that many ulama called him Sultan ul Ulama. You know, he was a Shafi'i or, 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 or mixed of Shafi'i or, or Maliki, rahmahullah ta'ala, in Bilal al-Sham, the great Al-Izz ibn Abdi Salam, great jurist and so on. Had great students who were great ulama, rahmahullah ta'ala jami'an, of whom is a great jurist, Al-Qarafi, who is a Maliki of Egypt, uh, who the famous uh, uh, work of Imam al-Qarafi pertaining to al-Qawaid uh, al-Fiqhiyya and, um, and um, uh, you know, the, the differences within those Qawaid al-Fiqhiyya and so on. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, classified the bid'ah from analysis of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and things such as these that I'm mentioning to you and all what I'm sharing with you is the barakat of those ulama rahimahullah ta'ala of that era and of all eras even in contemporary times we have benefited from the barakat of those ulama rahimahullah ta'ala and their beautiful hearts rahimahullah ta'ala so he, he mentions that there are five categories of bid'ah first of all the you know, the dual categorization or classification, good bid'ah versus bad bid'ah. Good bid'ah is, it could be wajib bid'ah, there is wajib bid'ah, there is mustahab bid'ah, and there is mubah bid'ah. Understood? This is the classification of good bid'ah. Either wajib bid'ah, wajib, obligatory, or mustahab or simply permissible. In each case, there are tons of examples, in each case, bid'ah is wajib if the rules of shara, if the sources of shara, if the principles of shara lead the scholar to argue that this thing is obligatory, whether ijma' or qiyas, or istihsan, or sabd al-dara'i, or al-masalih, etc. And the proper methodology, if it leads that it is wajib, then it is wajib, even if it has never been done before. Well, are you okay with this? It's normal. It makes a lot of sense. Many things, compiling actually, compiling the Qur'an, is actually wajib for the preservation of the Qur'an. That's why the ulama say, مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ wajib. The rule of law, that which is obligatory. And a means to it is the only means that leads to that obligatory, and that means becomes obligatory. Halas. And in this case, collecting the Qur'an, preserving the Qur'an is obligatory. A means to collect, to protect the Qur'an is obligatory. It is maslaha to protect the Qur'an. It is benefit to preserve the Qur'an, to collect the Qur'an. And that maslaha and that benefit leads to the verdict, it is obligatory to do that. This is a good bid'ah even to the extent it is obligatory. And there are many examples like that. Some ulama say even, you know, to preserve the meanings of the Qur'an and so on, the ulama developed later the sciences and the disciplines of grammar and of sarf nahu and sarf and balagha and badi'a which 
every student of ilm must study. That was not before. But it is either mustahab or obligatory because it helps preserve and promote the meanings in the Quran and the Quran to be read properly. Without it, that's why imagine, you see, when you don't know grammar and you go read the Quran without tashkil, you're going to, you're going to read the ayah, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءَ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ you don't know grammar, this is kufr. Really, you don't know grammar, this statement is kufr. In ayah in the Quran. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءَ The way I read it, if I didn't know grammar, and if it were without tashkeel, and I have heard people reading it that way, that's kufr. Because it should read, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ not Allah al ulama Allah al ulama Were it not for the science of grammar, for example, there will be people making these mistakes and reading kufr. And more. And this is a matter of deen. It's not just a matter of muhammad. The argument here is the source of argument, the evidence for the argument is Maslaha. Though there is no text that says you must develop the science of grammar. And Rasulullah didn't do that. He was innately grammarian. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the wahi of Allah Azza wa The Quran preserves the Arabic language. These are examples and many more about what is wajib of bid'ah or bid'ah mustahabba. They have tons of examples for that. And bid'ah mubah simply as long as the rules of shara, the sources of Islamic knowledge and the methodology of analysis of those sources leads the scholars mushtahidun to the conclusion that this is good or bad, that this is obligatory, or recommended, or permissible. And the bad bid'ah is either haram or makruh. There is haram bid'ah and there is makruh bid'ah. Haram bid'ah is it, if it falls in the category of that which the rules of shara identify as haram. Or it is makruh if it falls in the category of that which the rules of shara identify as makruh. And we know what is makruh either in the Quran or in the Sunnah, but we're speaking about bid'ah now, so it has not been there before, through either ijma or qiyas or istihsan or sadd al or masalih mursala and, and so on. And that's what the ulama have done. In his great work, يعني القواعد الكبرى, famous work to the ulama of Imam Al-Izz ibn Abd al-Salam, you know, the, the great axioms or principles of shara, in which he masters the aims and the objectives of sharia at the technical fiqh level and at the moral spiritual level. He was very special. Rahmahullah ta'ala wa radiallahu ta'ala. He, of those rules that he mentioned and were accepted but the rest of all the ulama, rahimahullah ta'ala, names are of hundreds and, and thousands after his time, rahimahullah ta'ala, who accepted this division because the division already existed before the dual you know, division classification. Good bid'ah and bad bid'ah. Now he came and elaborated on the good bid'ah and the bad bid'ah. And again, as I said, this the slack of his students, the great Imam Qarafi in his great work al Furuq also mentions these things. And it has been accepted by the ulama in all madhaib. 
Not one, not two, not ten, not twenty, not fifty. Hundreds. In our scholarly heritage. Those who Rahmanullah Ta'ala invite us to the book of Allah and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Those who have preserved by their hef and their meticulous uh, uh, memorization and meticulous reporting of the Quran and of the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are the ones who are helping us in saying there is good bid'ah, there is bad bid'ah derived from the Quran and the Sunnah as we have seen and even classified in this five-pronged classification that is very consistent as well. That's why you hear them say, this is bid'ah makruha. They say, bid'ah makruha. Bid'ah but not haram. Bid'ah makruha. Or bid'ah, bid'ah mubaha. Or bid'ah hasana. Etc. And these are the huge overwhelming majority of the ulama rahimahullah ta'ala ajma'in. In all the madhaim, the school of Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, after the time of Izz ibn Abd al-Salam, with time they all accepted that. After critically looking at it, and they loved it. It's consistent with the principles of the Sharh. Remember, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr said this is bid'ah. Then he thought about it, and there were discussions, as the ulama discussing. And then Sayyiduna Abu Bakr ended up with, I accept that statement, it is bid'ah hasana. So, al ibn Abd salam comes with this five-pronged classification. The ulama think about it, some probably looked at it with uh, suspicion, with a grain of salt, and then overwhelmingly, after that, with time, they all said, he's right. And some nowadays still don't accept that. Even some contemporary uh, people of ilm. Ghafar Allah lil jami'a wa rahimallahu ta'ala lil jami'a. Now having said that, the next thing, some of you might have heard of Imam Shatibi. Some probably most have not. Imam Shatibi was brought into, into modern fame, contemporary fame, because he's a scholar who lived in Al-Andalus, in the time of Al-Andalus, around, I think, the 9th century Hijri. And he was an Andalusian scholar, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and he kind of opined differently. And he identified Bid'ah in a different way. And he did not accept, uh, as his words were, the five-pronged classification. It was, in other words, one of the rare exceptions. And his book, al muwafaqat and his books, al Atasam, was made very famous from about uh, يعني, uh, the beginning of the 20th century by some Egyptian scholars. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And it was made into fame, and I personally had, alhamdulillah, the privilege to study his works, such as al muwafaqat and al Atasam, and I used to teach al Atasam also, in which he elaborates on the usul al-fiqh of bid'ah and sunnah. It was interesting. But when, if you're exposed only to that, and you're not exposed to the rest, you could be easily swayed. If you're a student of knowledge, or if you're no student of knowledge at all. Because some things require meticulous ob observation and checking. And if one has not reached yet scholarly maturity, anything that is said by an elder or a perceived scholar, if we don't know otherwise, becomes authority. Isn't it true? So I warn you and myself. I warn you and myself. Be careful. Whoever it is, diversify your sources of knowledge. No matter who it is, especially nowadays, no matter who he is, 
And I mean it well. And I've lived long enough to know that I personally made mistakes also. In terms of, that that's the process of learning. Mistakes, perhaps, of not checking and believing that what I was told or what I was read was the only thing. Because it was made to be so. To appear that way. Be careful. So in his classification, Rahimahullah, he says, no. Kullu bid'atin dalala. There is no such a thing as good bid'ah. What do you do with all of this? What do you do with all of this? What happened to all of this? At that time when I read the work, this was 20 and 30 years ago, personally, I didn't know otherwise. And things were not taught otherwise. This is what it was. To the extent many people nowadays, young as I was, and not so young who simply, you know, were entrenched into that, that's the only thing they know and they accept. They didn't know such a thing as good Buddha. What do you do with this? Now, a person who is free intellectually, as they themselves teach us rahimahullah ta'ala to be free intellectually seeking the pleasure of Allah Azza wa I cannot reject these arguments. They are very difficult to reject. Especially when they are upheld by all of you other ulama who are as great as a shatibi and much greater than the Imam Shatibi rahimahullah ta'ala. Much greater. But, as he says there is no such a thing, and these examples that I mentioned, which he mentioned some of them, not all, he accepts those examples. But he says, those are not even bid'ah. In other words, now he's using the word bid'ah in the technical sense that he shows. In other words, when he uses the word bid'ah, he means bad. So if something, somebody says it's a good bid'ah, and he agrees with that it is good, for him it is not bid'ah at all. That's the way we can reconcile the two opinions. In some cases, not in all cases. Did you understand? For example, the collection of the Qur'an by Sayyiduna Abu Bakr and Umar that he cannot deny, obviously. It's a fact. But he says that's not bid'ah at all. Excuse me? Rahimahullah, may Allah bless his soul. These are our predecessors. It's not Salaf of the Salaf. This is, I say, live around the 9th century Hijri from my recollection in Andalus. And the rest of the ulama opposed him anyways. But just we're mentioning this because this opinion became prevalent in the current uh, circles of a certain way to understand some of the matters of the deen. May Allah forgive all and, and reward all. So he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, well, he calls that Maslaha Mursala. Remember that? Maslaha Mursala. He says, no, that's Maslaha Mursala. That's not bid'ah at all. It's not bid'ah to say bid'ah hasana. It's not, we can't say wajib or hasan to a bid'ah. What do you think? This is very beautiful, but there is a trap in there which he did not pay attention to. As some ulama mentioned, rahimahullah ta'ala. And what is that? What is the fallacy in what he said? Though I already told you, that's one way to bridge the gaps. And I like to bridge gaps whenever possible. He said it is maslaha mursala. Let's see who has a very high fiqh Q here. Say that again. Yeah, okay. Sure. 
Just, just find the good words. Because you're on the right track, mashallah. I'm impressed. May Allah bless you. Yeah, continue. Exactly. You're saying the right thing, but you don't have all the words. You said 70% of it. Beautiful. The argument is, al-maslaha, al-mursala is a principle of law. Al-maslaha, al-mursala is a source of law. You know, you can't say, exactly, you can't say, bid'a hasana, bid'a hasana. This is not because the, the statement bid'a hasana is a verdict. Is a hukm taklifi. Right? Is a verdict. Is a hukm taklifi. Hasan, because it's mustahab. It's, it's a verdict. And a verdict is not the source of law. The source of law leads you to the verdict. So you have not said much. Al Maslah al Mursala is a source of law. The ulama indeed have used, as you say, al-maslah al-mursala as a source of law which led them to the verdict, it is good. So if you say, no, we can't say it is good, it is maslah al-mursala, it's not juristically consistent. It's, it's a fallacy, it's a fumble, because that's a source of law and that's a verdict. You understand? Yes, it is Maslaha Mursala because it is the means and the evidence or the source that led them to argue that it is good. And therefore, some ulama say, Imam, rahimakallah, for the past three centuries ago, you know, he didn't say much. Similarly with other things. Do you understand? So there is something as good bid'ah and bad bid'ah. And there is the five-pronged classification because it is the overwhelming majority of experts who say that. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Now, how to reconcile his view with the views of the majority of the scholars? I already said something about that. First of all, all the scholars of ilm, the mushtahidun of this ummah, they all emphasize ittiba' to follow Rasulullah sallallahu to follow the original authentic tradition in scholarship and to avoid and to avert ibtida' in the negative sense now, ibtida' in the negative sense all of them say that. There is no scholar word of the name, especially the scholars that have become famous in scholarship of old. No one says otherwise. Second, there are matters in which they agree, and there are matters in which they disagree, even when they agree on the principle. Even when they agree on the text, even if there were texts, sometimes the way they understand and they analyze the text, that is dependent on what's inside that blue box, they can come out sometimes with different conclusions. And that exists all the time, even in the question of bid'ah. You can find scholars, even amongst those who accept the five-pronged classification, almost all of them, and yet sometimes this issue, one says it is bid'ah, in the sense, bad bid'ah. And some says, no, it is not bid'ah, or this is good bid'ah. That happens. That happens. It happened even to whom? Now, if you're with me, if you're learning well, because we have established all these questions. I'm not anymore inventing anything on my part. Because who, who, ha who did that? No? Exactly. You see that? 
He's Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala and Umar after that. They say, this is good bid'ah. Sayyidina Zayd ibn Thabit says, this is bad bid'ah. They disagreed. And lo and behold, after a while, they agreed that it is good bid'ah. As I said, what this, what this should teach the ulama, the scholars, and we, the imitators and the students, if we are students of ilm, to be patient and not to be so passionate about what my teacher said. And my teacher told me to the extent that I'm going to say, you know, my way or the highway. Scholars change their minds. As they say, only donkeys don't change their minds. Our ulama say, Ali who seeks the truth, errs, makes mistakes. That doesn't diminish from their scholarship. It's okay. As long as they are scholars, mushtahidun, radiallahu ta'ala anhum so I, our attitude should be, the safe attitude is not to be on our part judgmental when there are differences. And not to impose it. And worst of all, not to develop animosity for the one who is different within the context of their disagreements. Because as I said, even those who accept those who accept all these principles and they agree with them, they could come to different conclusions. And some uphold their opinions and some change their opinions with time. The other point, statistically speaking, if one or two or three or four experts say something, and 200 experts say the opposite. What does a court of law decide? In a case where, you know, the experts testimony. You know, one party brings two experts, the other says, I'll show you. And they bring 200 experts saying the opposite. Experts honestly under oath, etc. The court is going to take by the that's safe, that's safest, intellectually, rationally, and, and morally, and spiritually, it is safer. As long as they are all experts, ulama who fear Allah Azza wa Jal, and love Allah Azza wa Jal, and who are bright, and especially if bright, and deeply spiritual. We're going to take our recess here, inshallah ta'ala, and we resume in another seven minutes, b'idhillah ta'ala, and we continue on the subject matter for another hour or less, and then, and then salatul asr, and then after that, the session is for all your questions, b'idhillah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.